Now, what uh, determines this closure time, uh, I won't go into great detail, but obviously if you haven't got a playlist, you know, you're going to uh, prolong your closure time. One thing that surprises a lot of people is that hematocrit is a, is a determinant of this. And so if you're a severely anemic patient, you will get prolonged closure times. But on the other hand, this is somewhat physiological since anemic patients bleed more than non-anemic patients. And I, by the time I could explain to you why that is. And of course, defects in platelet function, whether they're drug-induced, whether they're induced with other acquired uh, reasons, or whether they're congenital, will all give you prolonged closure times. And the test is highly dependent on uh, the presence of adequate amounts of von Willebrand factor. Now, as I alluded to, um, the, the, the cartridge, the, the epinephrine cartridge will, is your primary screening cartridge and will be abnormal uh, for, with, the, with the majority of defects that you saw on the previous slide. So if it's a true platelet defect, whether it's a congenital one like a Glansman's thrombosthenia or a Sulier syndrome, you're going to see prolongations in both cartridges. But in the presence of, of aspirin, if, it, if you're just seeing an aspirin defect, then typically what you see is a prolonged epinephrine and normal ADP. There's one caveat, though, that if you get a patient with a storage pool disease, now in, in Florida we have a number of patients in our books with hermansky pudlak syndrome, which is one of the storage pool re release type defects, which is the common single gene defect in Puerto Rico, which is why we see quite a few of them in Florida, these typically present looking like aspirin. They have a long uh, closure time in epinephrine and normal ADP, so you have to be a little bit careful in just describing this effect to aspirin alone. There have been an awful lot of studies that have looked at the sensitivity of the PFA and compared that to the bleeding time and its ability to detect von Willebrand's disease. And there's no question that for the, uh, the more difficult to diagnose type 1 forms of von Willebrand's disease, the PFA does have significantly better sensitivity than, the, uh, than does the bleeding time. And overall, as you can see, just to, to summarize uh, all the different things that the PFA has been used for, they typically, you know, the PFA will come out on top in terms of screening for von Willebrand's disease, in screening for the presence of aspirin. The two tests, bleeding time and PFA, are about the same when it comes to uh, detection of congenital platelet function uh, 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 disorders. They're about the same when you look at the when you compare the epinephrine cartridge at least for the detection of secretion defects. But the bleeding time is probably better for um, than the ADP cartridge in the detection of a uh, secretion defect. Now, I do want to say a, a word because I mentioned at the start that 95% of the nation's bleeding times were done for, uh, for preoperative testing. And, it, and it's still, I think, in many centers, there's a, a call amongst physicians, mainly for litigation reasons, I suspect, to run preoperative hemostatic testing. And almost every paper that's ever been written on this subject, with a few uh, exceptions that are more specialized surgery, have not shown any value in any kind of preoperative platelet function testing. Well, there was a study done um, not too long ago that really looked at this question in a very large number of patients. And the interesting thing about this, this study is, apart from the size of the study, was that they really used the, the history as a way of discriminating the value of the individual uh, laboratory test. And the bottom line is, that if you, if you just do this right across the board without regard for history, your, your ability to detect hematitic defects is ex extremely low. The number that you're going to pick up for the numbers of screenings that you do is very, very low. If, however, you get a good clinical history and target just those with a positive clinical history, then your hit rate, so to speak, in finding defects in that population is extremely high. And if you look over on the left-hand side of this slide, I can't see it too well from where I'm standing, but in the, in the patients, the 600 and some odd patients with a positive bleeding history, a, a significant proportion of those patients had abnormalities on testing. And the PFA was extremely good at detecting a great majority of those abnormalities. Now, other tests of platelet function, of course, are, uh, are platelet irrigation. And I'll talk about some different ways of doing that. Um, the, the newer kids on the block, the more point of care type methods like Verify Now and Platelet Works, flow cytometry and thromboelastography, which you heard a little about uh, in Dr. Mann's talk. Well, in terms of platelet irrigation, you really have two choices. You have the conventional optical aggregometry, which I'm sure the majority of, of laboratories that do aggregation will use or the impedance or luminescence aggregometry using the chronolog line of, of aggregometers. And just to, to remind you what the principle of optical aggregometry is, you have a, a cuvette containing your platelet suspension, the light uh, passes through that, 
uh, agonists are added to your suspension of platelets, they aggregate, allowing more light to pass through, and so you get a, a readout from your chart recorder or computer of uh, light transmission. And that will look something like this. Uh, here's an example of some, of some traces that are normal with the collagen and ADP. And then the red line at the top is uh, an example of what happens in a patient that's taken aspirin, for example, and you try aggregating with arachidonic acid and you get essentially a straight line. Impedance ag um, aggregometry is, is quite interesting if you're not familiar with this principle. Basically, you can use platelet-rich plasma or whole blood, and you immerse this electrode that you see here on the screen into your sample. You can see the electrode has two, uh, two parallel electrodes, and an electric current is passed across those electrodes. And when you immerse it into, into a suspension of uh, either blood or platelet-rich plasma, the platelets will, again, do what platelets do, and they'll stick, and they'll form a monolayer across those electrodes. And if you just don't do anything else, that's where it'll, that's where it'll finish up. You then add an ag aggregating agent, like collagen or ADP or whatever you want, you then get aggregation on top of that monolayer, and then what you get is a change in the electrical impedance across those two electrodes. And what the machine measures is the resistance of that, cur that uh, current in ohms, which is in fact a reflection, almost a mirror image of what you see with uh, optical aggregation. Uh, the advantage, of course, of, of doing it this way is you can do it in, uh, in whole blood. And if you have one of the instruments that has the luminescence channel in it, you can also look, because this instrument will measure ATP release, you can also look at the ability of the platelets to release uh, various constituents, including ATP, from the, uh, the granules during the release reaction. This allows you to detect things like uh, storage pool defects with greater uh, accuracy than uh, conventional agrogometry. And here's an example of a normal uh, response to collagen shown in, in red, the aggregation trace at the top, and then a green um, trace at the bottom, which corresponds to the ATP release for that sample, and then a sample with subnormal aggregation to collagen with a, a, a longer lag phase, a, a slower rate of aggregation, less extent of aggregation, and that's accompanied by the release of significantly less ATP. Now, what are the advantages? Well, because you don't have to uh, prepare platelet-rich plasma, it's much quicker to do in the laboratory, uh, it's much less handling of the blood samples, which is certainly advantageous as far as platelets are concerned. Uh, it's much easier to assess release. It's, uh, if you do a lot of pediatrics, you're using a much smaller sample to get your results, and it's technically uh, overall uh, an awful lot uh, easier. It is, on the other hand, as, you know, affected, as you might imagine, by thrombocytopenia, at least in whole blood, because you can't adjust the platelet count in the same way that you can. But down to about 80,000, it gives perfectly good results. Now, the, the, the newer kit on the block, I guess, in terms of aggregation, would be the, uh, the Verify Now uh, uh, analytical system. It used to be called the Ultegra Rapid Platelet Function uh, Analyzer, which basically has fibrinogen-coated beads. And then the platelets are activated by a specific agonist. And when, you, when the platelets are activated, they expose glycoprotein 2B3A. That is then free to interact with the fibrinogen on these coated beads, and you get aggregation and then a light source uh, through the mixing chamber gives you an aggregating trace and the instrument measures all the parameters uh, automatically. And it's a very uh, convenient, very uh, slick system. And you also have the platelet work system, which works on the, on the uh, principle of counting single platelets. Because when you aggregate platelets, you imagine a suspension of platelets, you then add an aggregating agent. Platelets, instead of being discrete individual cells, become initially doublets and triplets and so on and so forth. They aggregate. And then if you do, if you do a count of the single platelets that remain, a fixed time after addition of the aggregating agent, you in effect get, again, a mirror image of the aggregation curve. And this was something that uh, I think was developed originally by, uh, by Dr. Stan Heptonstall and his colleagues in, uh, in England. And it's very, very useful, very sensitive way of looking for, uh, for, for anti-platelet effects.